Good morning, I'm Julio Sainz along with Marisa Riveros. Today we'll meet Maribel and Matt Honeyford, owners of Honeyford Real Estate, and learn how they started their own commercial and residential real estate company. We hope you will be inspired. Celebrating leaders in Rochester's unique and vibrant business community, we'll meet entrepreneurs whose passion and perseverance have helped push through life's challenges. Join us as we share their stories and journeys to success. It's time to be inspired. Hi, Matt and Maribel. Thank you very much to be, be inspired. A show that we developed to inspire our community to interview interesting people who are in different types of businesses. And today is really an honor to have you back, Maribel. I know that we uh, had an interview when we were just doing the radio show and now in the TV and have also your husband is, is really an honor. So let's just start learning who is Maribel and Matt. Yes, sir. Um, so uh, we are, um, well, we're real estate people. Uh, we own and operate a real estate uh, company. Uh, my wife does residential real estate and I do uh, commercial and investment real estate. Yeah, we recently um, unplugged from a big company and decided to go on our own journey uh, as a broker. And uh, we are the Honey for Real Estate team. And as you know, we are a mom and pop shop. <laughs> And we try to do the best that we can to provide, you know, uh, the best customer service for our clients. What led you to get into the real estate business? So it started first as looking for uh, a career. I did international business and I was looking to get into workforce. Uh, as you know, I'm from Costa Rica. So I do speak Spanish and I start looking into different things and I came across a company that was uh, interviewing and it's like, you know what, I'm going to give it a shot. This sounds very interesting. Um, and it's so, it's so completely, totally different in Costa Rica. So it was a learning experience in, from, you know, beginning to now. And uh, we have enjoyed every minute of it. I, he was with me in the open houses all the time. So uh some people don't know but you cannot talk real estate unless you have your license and start specific topics so he loves real estate and so i encourage him to get his his real estate license and it just took off you know i mean he loves the commercial part i love the residential part so it just works out perfect for us yeah. that is wonderful i love the story of you guys coming together, working together, and develop something for the future of your family and, and serving the community, which is very important and is essential. Now, uh, Maribel, we are in a, in a different world now. The market in Rochester you know, has changed significantly. Uh, you know, a few months ago, very difficult to find inventory. Uh, it was very difficult to find, find houses available. Uh, what's going on today, and what's the projections in your perspective? It's funny you ask because I remember when you asked me that when we met in the radio station and you asked me, how long do you think this is going to last? And I remember then I set up, I think the probably three years, but I wasn't expected to have a pandemic. So uh, things that was kind of like the tipping factor of things going even crazier. So the market has been very crazy. Uh, the amount of offers that I can put for one person are 30 or 40 offers and we still don't get a house. So is that hard? That part is very hard for people to to swallow because it's a very emotional situation. You know, decision to buy a house and on top of that, getting so many no's, it makes you wonder, it makes you question about many things. So um, I really hope it's going to get better, but I have heard other things. Um, during the summer, although I've been having much luck with the buyers that I've been carrying them through almost over a year, um, getting the houses locked, um, because it, what I have seen is that almost like people got tired of getting no's, so got off of putting offers, probably because the summer, you know, it's summer, let's take a break, maybe we'll come back once the school starts kind of thing. So I noticed that I wasn't competing against 30, 40 offers. I was competing against six or sometimes three. So it gave me better odds to get the house. Now on the commercial side, uh, Matt, what's it looking like? Uh, is it just crazy? Where's it going? What's going on? Uh, well, uh, 
I guess from a multi uh, multifamily perspective, it's you know class A multifamily is is always really sought after and and hard to find, right? And if you were to look at the number of uh, new build permits uh, that are being pulled here, you know regionally, maybe even nationally, there's there's really not enough housing being developed right now, and that ties in with what Maribel was talking about. I think that what we're seeing with this pandemic and with things like the eviction and the foreclosure um, moratorium is only gonna make it harder to find homes and, and to find houses. And that's gonna create a lot, of, a lot of upward pressure on rents and with lumber prices and materials being the way that they are right now and a lack of new permits being pulled, finding good class A multifamily is uh, is very tough to do. Excuse me, Mauricio and Matt, because I know you both work in this in this in this field around construction and, and even commercial. Why aren't there more permits? Why do you think there's this not enough new properties being built? I don't know. I I tend to think that it's a logistical problem, right? It's business logistics, it's pipeline, it's materials. Uh, we were looking at uh, developing and building, um, you know, a storage facility. Uh, and you know, looking at pricing overhead doors, the wait time on one overhead door is almost eight months. So you know, I, we have a hard time even getting appliances right now. Uh, I, you know, we're buying washers and dryers uh, and dishwashers at retail and waiting four weeks to get them. Right. So it, you know, it's it's been challenging. I. I think it's a supply line problem, but I really don't know. <laughs> it probably is a bunch of things that are connected in this thing because with the clients that I have that have built or are building, you know, it's they they heard, you know, it takes six months. I have a lady yeah. who took a year and a half through the pandemic to build her house because they just couldn't finish it for X, Y, or C. They didn't have materials, they didn't have enough workers, you know. So everybody's fighting to have somebody to work on, on those buildings. So, she, I mean, she, we couldn't even believe it. I, I, I told her, like, we probably broke the record of how long it took, <laughs> you know, for them to build her house. I mean, it was a 2,100 square feet. They should not take a year and a half plus, probably. Yeah. So now Maribel and, and Matt, uh, Rochester, it always, you know, intrigues me because, you know, when you analyze the the growth, the demographic growth, uh, population-wise, is not really growing so much. Why is such a crazy demand? Is is what what is happening? Is that that we have? Are we receiving migrants uh, coming people from other states? What is happening? You know, it's it's difficult for me to understand that factor. Maybe you guys, as a realtors, living in the ground and seeing the variety of people moving from maybe uh, the city. I don't know, but it's a it's a question that I always ask and. I cannot find the answer. What's what is happening? What's driving this this high demand of housing? I can only give you what I believe to be true. Um, City of Rochester is 80% something like this, 80% landlord owned um, and, and investor owned. And if you look at the Rochester market compared to other parts of the country, um, Rochester is a very good market for you to invest in, right? So you have a lot of out of state buyers coming here, looking at Rochester and buying up residential multifamily. But still with that being the problem is that you have this large, this large population that is now entering the workforce that is also looking to buy homes, right? So you have lack of housing already to begin with People want to buy more homes. The barrier to entry now is so high because in order for you to compete, you've got to buy with cash. So I guess what I'm going to say is it's this weird thing that I believe where you have this large population that's now entering the home buying market and there's not enough inventory to begin with, which creates kind of this vacuum. If there's no inventory, then somebody that has a house is afraid to sell it because where are they going to go? Mm -hmm. So they don't sell it, but the younger people want to buy, but all that's available is landlord owned real estate. 
And something that we also notice is that uh, in my particular case, is people coming from other states. There's the states there where properties are more expensive. So they come to Rochester and they see houses so cheap to their eyes. You know, it's not cheap to most of us, but it's cheap to them. So um, they overpay. They think they will, they, they sold in California, they sold in Chicago, they sold even in New York City. I have people coming from New York City and just buying cash in here. So for those people that come with bigger money, uh, they can come and buy cash. And it's not competition to the most common buyer in Rochester. And I think also the cost to build right now okay. is significantly more than the cost to buy. In other parts of the country, that's not necessarily true, right? And I think once it starts to level out, then you'll start seeing this market relax a little bit. But in, in my opinion, we're a long ways from a market correction. Thank you, Matt and Maribel. We'll be back with more after these messages. Now, you're also on top of all this balancing a family. So tell us a little bit about how you do that. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, we survive more than balancing, uh, <laughs> if we can call it that way. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's a juggle, juggling act. Uh, we take turns. We use nannies. We use family. It's a combination of, of a lot of things, especially during summer. We use camps during summer as yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, but because of the ages, you know, for babies, there are no camps. So uh, we have to use babysitters or, or, or just us, you know, just, yeah. hey, I, I, I need you to cover here, <laughs> yep. you know, so one comes in, the other comes out. Sometimes they come with us, right? <laughs> yes. You know, uh, my, my oldest, she's walked properties with me before, right? Um, you know, so. Yesterday we went to put a, a soul sign on a property and she goes, mom, that's you. And I said, yeah. She goes, can I be the next sign? <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to yeah. create a new one. I, I think it's a lifestyle. Right, it's a lifestyle, and our family is very much a part of our lifestyle. And real estate is not a job; it's not eight to five; it's all the time. Um, and you really have to love it. And I think we really, truly do. We do, and not we only we not only do love it. We want our kids to, in a way, observe that you know. You need to work hard in life, basically. You yeah. know. Well, that is wonderful, and what example of. Uh, loving what you do because in the end that's what matters because you are spending you know 60 70 80 percent of your life in that and if you don't love it why you do it and i think that's a fundamental testimony of who you are maribel you uh, of course coming from costa rica you have a lot of hispanic well, at least i remember a lot of hispanic clients um, what's your perception? What's your perspective? Um, is that the com Hispanic community start getting more buying power in terms of housing? Uh, what you know, you have been many years in this business. Are you seeing a trend going up? The Hispanic, uh, you know, people uh, population uh, being owners of houses. H how is that trending? I do. I think that um, I think the hardest part with the Latino community, and I think it's just a thing that maybe we are not educated in that field, and it's about saving. Um, and that buy-in do have some closing costs that most people think, you know, that they don't exist or they get mixed up about um, down payment and closing costs. So they get confused and they thought that they couldn't need this much and now I need this much. So sometimes they come to me and we are one or two years of waiting because I need them to save some money. And especially in this particular case that we are right now, and it's because uh, if we were to put an offer today and I'm asking for concessions or I'm, or I'm using a grant, and is a lot of people competing for the same house, the chances of that person getting that house are very slim to none. Tell us a little bit more about the, the commercial side of things. I've always been fascinated by that, just because, uh, you know, I think there's this, this perception, and I, I know a lot of folks that, you know, know that we have this show and know that we, we've been entrepreneurs ourselves, and a lot of folks just dream of getting into owning rental property. Um, sure. so what, what, what are, 
what's the what are some of the good parts of that and what are the some of the challenging parts to getting into that business i think getting into it is easy right it's i think it's easier than people think i think people look at uh, commercial real estate or just even small multifamily and they go too many problems um too much capital is is needed what about management etc cetera, etc cetera. i think those are a lot of very convenient excuses right mind you it's not for everybody um the challenges that exist that that we've gone through um in the beginning was quite honestly capital right you know how do you scale to go from one to many um once we were able to solve the capital problem uh then it became management right well how do you manage all these properties and all these tenants in this giant pile of mail right that you get every day <laughs> And, and then after management is figured out, now it's reporting because in, in a lot of cases, we're raising private capital to purchase properties. We have a responsibility to investors to not only pay investors, obviously pay investors, but also uh, provide a certain level of transparency and report it. And you know, with that, there's, there's a lot of back end work that has to take place. Um, which we're figuring out and we'll continue to figure out. And what's after that, the challenge after the reporting? I'm not <laughs> sure, but I know we're going to run into it eventually. But it's, it's, it's a fascinating business. Um, it's provided a really nice uh, lifestyle, I think, for us. Um, and uh, it's something I'm looking forward to. We're, we're looking forward to continuing to do and grow. What's the future of your uh, organization? How do you see your organization in 10 years from now? <laughs> that is a, a, a really good good question. I'm part of a mastermind program and, and they, they have us thinking three years out. So if it's okay, could I, <laughs> can I answer the three year the question? Shorter version. Yeah. Um, you know, I think in, in, in three years, we, we certainly have revenue expectations, but you know, for me, it's time, right? And I'm not saying I don't want to work, but I am saying that we've, <laughs> we've been working a lot for a long time. And in the next three years, uh, my goal is to hire, hire some, some staff, bring on some help, some support, um, while still maintaining our, our, our style of living, which is not, you know, incredibly high, but it's, it's comfortable. And if I can get more time back in my day to spend with my family and, you know, my friends and do things that I will love, love, love to do, um, in three years, I'll be thrilled, <laughs> absolutely thrilled. And I think the same goes for me. You know, I think that almost days I do wake up and I run all day, um, a lot in with many different hats. So if I can somehow, I wouldn't say combine hats, but more like, you know, um, not only help, but figure out better ways to tackle, uh, that will be good. That will be great. <laughs> Cause it will give us a, a, a better, um, I want to say a stressful life because I don't think that we've been no. that is stressful even through this whole pandemic thing. Yeah. Um, but uh, even though it came with a lot of work, to be honest. Well, it's 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 wonderful, really, to see Matt and and you know it, one thing that is fundamental is is I learned years ago is to create an organization that is self sustainable. An organization that you can have the teams that can perform as you will be performing and be able to uh, empower people and grow people. And that's the beauty of business is that you can create jobs for others. Uh, you mm -hmm. have done as a founders of your organization, you have established the great foundation. And now you need to start developing the skills in others that will allow you to continue to grow but you know, be able to have time with your family and invest in the things that you want to invest. So congratulations. Really, again, you. you know, when we have people like you in the interviews, really inspire me to see that it's real, that it's possible, that anyone who wants to do something and dreams in something, if they work hard, they can achieve. To finish, what will be your message to people who are watching right now? Maybe they are in depression. Maybe they are, you know, in this circumstance, what do I do with my life? 
you guys took the risk, you guys worked very hard, and now you, you are seeing the, the fruits of your hard work. What will be the message to that people right now? I would say that even if you're doing four jobs like I did at some point, you know, in um, uh, at that time, it, it felt like, you know, I wasn't going to get out of that and I wasn't going to go any farther, but you just have to have those goals ahead of you and just focus on that and working little by little, you know, it's, it's almost like carving into finding this diamond that you, that you want. Maribel and Matt, thank you very much. You have inspired us tonight, today, and was a wonderful opportunity to be together. Uh, congratulations for the achievements. And I am sure that in the future, we'll have you back in the show and we will continue to see the growth of an organi organization that really has values and really you care about your clients. And also you are having fun with your husband and your wife and that's a great model of working so thank you very much for being inspired today coming up next week on be inspired we'll meet hugo acosta publisher of cny latino newspaper a bilingual publication that's grown to cover most of new york state to watch today's episode and the complete interviews of our guests, go to rochesterfirst.com slash be inspired. For more great talk with Rochester's entrepreneurs, listen to Bodet 97.1, Saturdays at 9 a.m. For Mauricio Riveros, I'm Julio Sainz. We'll see you next week on Be Inspired.